السلام علیکم السلام علیکم جزاک اللہ خیر آپ کیپ ڈوئنگ دیٹ ویلکم ٹو دی تھرڈ اینیول کنوینشن آف دا مسلم الائنس آف انڈیانا وی ٹرولی اپریشیٹ یور کمنگ ہیئر ٹوڈے اینڈ اینڈ آئی ایم آنرڈ ٹو بی اسٹینڈنگ تھینک یو اینڈ آئی ایم آنرڈ ٹو بی اسٹینڈنگ ہیئر ان مائی فورتھ ایئر ایکچولی مائی فورتھ ایئر ایز ایگزیکٹو ڈائریکٹر آف دا مسلم الائنس آف انڈیانا On your tables is a number of things that I want to pay it, uh, bring to your attention. First of all, there should be a, 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 a booklet that looks like this. It's the Muslim Alliance of Indiana annual report. It's the annual report for last year. And in an era, this year our board decided that every year our annual report would be published in our magazine and would go out to 10,000 Uh, Muslim Hoosiers are all across the state. So we have that before you, and I'll be talking a little about it. Second, you'll also see the new look of the Muslim Hoosier magazine. Uh, the Muslim Hoosier magazine goes out to 10,000 uh, people. This includes all elected state, federal, and local officials, all public libraries. In fact, uh, just a few months ago, uh, myself and Chris Warden were traveling to Evansville to meet with the mayor of Evansville, Mayor Weinzapple. And when we were giving him the magazine, as I was giving him the full package, he said, I have the other ones. I just hadn't seen the, the, one, the latest one that was hot off the press. So people do actually read this. And this is a way for us to go out and put a face on who we are, who the people in this room are, and who the people across the state are. In this room today, we have people from South Bend. We have people here from Evansville, Columbus, Bloomington, all of the Indianapolis uh, Masajid. We have, of course, Fort Wayne here. We have Muncie, West Lafayette. And they're here because all of them believe in value of us coming together. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu used to say, my people are like drops of water. You bring them together and they become a stream and they will benefit the community. And we all believe that and that's why we're here. Over this past year, through your support and On the last page, we have some financials that will tell you some of what, how we spend the money. And uh, I'll go briefly over this. Our board has been very conscious about being very philanthropically responsible. As many of you know, my master's is in philanthropy, and it's the, stud it's the subject of my PhD. And an ideal nonprofit organization is one that has a third in fees, a third in individual philanthropy, and a third in grant funding. And this year, In 2009, through your support, we are going to meet that. A third of our money is going to come through individual fund donations. We're ending the year in a deficit neutral year, so we'll, we'll have raised money for everything we have uh, spent. A third will come through grants from the US Department of Justice, the Zakat Foundation, and the Islamic Relief. And a third come through fees. People pay, you paid for tickets to come here. You've paid registration fees. You have advertised in our magazine. And all of these things as a community, through philanthropic resources, through corporate resources, and through grants, we make this a reality. Over this past year, our Women's Fund has become a nationally known program. In fact, Rafia Zakaria, who's our leader, uh, standing in the back, Rafia, please stand. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Rafia has taken on challenge cases. In fact, we are the first organization in this country to test asylum law under the new Obama administration, which will see whether domestic, which allows domestic violence to be considered when applying for asylum. And we'll be the first American organization, not just American Muslim organization, to do a test case. And that's because of Rafia's leadership there. Over this past year, we have served Muslim women and we have served women who are married to Muslims that are victims of domestic violence. And we have shown and we have taken leadership on this issue of domestic violence. We value women as Muslims, and nobody says it better than the Muslim Alliance of Indiana Women's Fund. In fact, when last year, as you know, Bridges uh, TV had the tragedy when uh, the co-owner of Bridges TV was killed, due to a domestic violence incident. We were the only organization that was able to go out and say, you can't say that about Muslims because we've taken leadership here. Second program we started through your help this year 
was to create a legal services program for those that can't afford to have legal services. Access to justice, adul, this is part of our faith. We believe that as any person in our community, regardless of their faith, who is denied access to justice, our community is worse for it. Over the, currently we have 100 cases open providing indigent, providing indigent uh, Hoosiers with services. 80% of our clients are non-Muslim. Over this past year, since January when we started this program, we have served 500 of these clients. 80% of our clients that we have served are Muslim. These are people here that have seen the true face of Islam through the service that we have provided them. This is all through your support. Our programs have been recognized by the Indianapolis Bar Foundation, which recently gave us uh, grants that thanks to Al Huda and the Fort Wayne community, we were able to make that match. And we appreciate your support in doing so. In addition to that, Islamic Relief, which is the largest worldwide Muslim uh, charity, earlier this way year went to the United States Department of Agriculture and asked them to provide food uh, food, excess food supply from America to the Muslim world, to areas like Pakistan and Palestine that need this. The U.S. Department of Agriculture said, you're doing great work overseas, but can you point to one thing you've done in this country? And it was a valid question, and, you asked, and I met with Abid Ayyub, the CEO of um, Islamic Relief. He came to visit our shelter, our programs that they had provided, and he said the only thing they could point to them was the Muslim Alliance of Indiana. And what they were lucky was that our annual report gave them such rich information that the US Department of Agriculture agreed to do co-host an iftar at the White House with Islamic Relief. Now, this is happening here in Indiana. This is happening through all of your help. We're getting calls from Ohio, from Maryland, and Texas for us to explain to them how we do what we're doing here. And the reason is those people need to come here and look at all of you because it's through all of your efforts and all of your ideas and all of your time that we're able to make this happen. I'm just gonna briefly go through two more because I know I'm taking up some of the time uh, and, I, and I don't want to take too much of the congressman's time. But there are two other things that we did. We said, we want to put a face of Muslims and what's the best way of doing that? We got, went on TV and we did two campaigns. If you remember, earlier this year, there was the Gaza offensive and we were all hurting. We saw what was happening there, and we thought, what can we do? And there were all these emails. We said, let's write letters, and we did that. We said, let's go to rallies, and we did that. But the Muslim Alliance of Indiana said that's not enough. So what we did was we hired, through Congressman Carson's support, we don't know political advertising. His campaign does. So I called his office up, and I said, how do I do this? This is the message I want to do. I don't want to talk about politics. I want to talk about the humanitarian distress in Gaza. And his staff said, these are the people we use. These are the avenues we use. And this is the way you can get the most bang for your buck. And they contacted me with uh, Comcast. And we reached out to 800,000 homes. Now, based on the wonderful staff that he has, we paid for a week's worth of advertising. Uh, but through a number of mistakes and because his office does so much business, they couldn't offend us. So they made some mistakes and they kept running the ad. And the ad went on for four weeks. And I, I put that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> but some of it I thank the congressman for his staff to really providing that leadership for us to provide that avenue of this politically this kind of, it's a very specialized area, and he provided us the means. So that was one area. We wanted to do it smart. Do you know how much that campaign cost? It's $2,000. We reached out to 800,000 Comcast customers statewide, prime time, four weeks, $2,000. We can do things smart when we come together and we have the leadership of our congressman here. The second thing we did... The second thing I di uh, we did, we wanted to create a face of Muslims on a weekly basis all across Indiana. Judge David Shaheed, our board member, has done this before. He's produced weekly TV shows. So what we did 
was we, through Judge David Shade, Rafia Zakaria, Rabi Sufi, Uzma Mirza, we brought them together and created a show called the Muslim, Ho uh, Muslim Hoosier Show. Runs every week in Bloomington, runs every week in Evansville, and Andaz every week in Fort Wayne from, that's right. And I'm working on Indianapolis. That show is also running on Bridges TV nationwide. And the problem that we are facing now is that we produced the first six pilots. They were very successful. It had three segments, domestic policy, foreign policy, five normal Muslim Americans talking about politics and not talking about blowing up the world. And that seemed to create a very positive message such that NPR is working with us to distribute this to other cities. And then what we did was we got the chairman of the FICA Council of North America to come and talk about domestic violence, terrorism, talk about Islam and all these issues that people keep, people keep telling us we don't condemn violence. It's because nobody listens to us. We do it all the time. They listen to those that don't. But now we have our own media outlet to do that. We've been getting so many offers, and PBS asked us to change the name of the show from Muslim Hoosier to the American Muslim Perspectives because they felt that this was the first program at the national level that was doing what it was doing, and we owed it to this country to be able to, do, to, be able to provide that nationwide. And we're going to do that, and we're going to be filming in the next four, show, next four shows next week. And many of you, I appreciate many of you this weekend provided some information, uh, uh, provided some quotes and stuff that can be used in that show. But these are smart ways that all other communities have used and that we need to do that. At the Muslim Alliance of Indiana, we are committed to do that. Finally, just to talk to you about just the last three days, and I'm taking a lot of your time. What have we achieved this weekend? Why have we achieved this weekend? Why are we here today? This week, starting on Monday, we started the convention. Students watched movies about Islam, produced by Muslims, with the points of view that we wanted them to watch. So we had students on this campus watching that. On Thursday, we had a luncheon here. Two Supreme Court justices of five were there. 20 judges, including the chief judge of the Court of Appeals, was there. We had the leadership of the bar of, in, of the donut counties, Indianapolis, the Hamilton County, and so on, were there. We had elected state officials, and they saw the Muslim Alliance of Indiana give the Judge David Shaheed access to justice award to two non-Muslims. One, to Boone County Judge Steve David. He was appointed the chief public defender to Guantanamo Bay. He has fought with the White House, with the Department of Justice, with CIA, with the FBI, and the military, saying that torture is not acceptable, the rule of law is be above everything, and national security is about na and rule of law. <laughs> the second award was given to Lori Boyd. She is the di executive director of the Heartland Pro Bono Foundation Council. Their responsibility, every poor Hoosier living in central Indiana must get legal defense. And it's not enough that they should be, that, that just because they don't have money, they won't get that. And we gave that award to them. The award was given to the newly inaugurated Judge David Shaheed Award. It'll be given out every year. But it was a powerful day with over 100 of our leaders for this state. There are 1,000 people. Chris Warden tells me there are 1,000 people that are the most powerful people in this state. 100 of them were there that day. And they saw the face of Islam, and they fought, saw the face of Muslim Ujurs. Yesterday, we flew in. <laughs> Yesterday, we flew in the Qadi of Jerusalem and Rabbi Ron Cronish of Jerusalem. And we put them in a room down the road, down, this, down there, and we had all the interfaith partners from from around town. We had Muslims, we had Christians, we had Jews, we had other faiths. 70 people RSVP'd, and I thought it was only Muslims that don't RSVP, but it seems like it's an interfaith uh, problem. <laughs> we had 125 people. I, knowing the Muslim part of it, I had increased our numbers, but we ran out of food, then we ran out of chairs, then we ran out of space, and then the room was standing room only. It was packed. And then, if you looked outside, Azar was there, Pinky Bobby was there. And when you looked outside, next door in the Juma prayer, there were 100 people there. Before you guys came to us this morning, we had already met 400 people, 
Muslims, Christians, Jews, other faiths that saw the face of Muslim Hoosiers. We have some special guests. Um, you'll be meeting, Brother Andre is going to be l l talking to us tonight, and we're very grateful that he always puts us first. Thank you. He has been there on CNN, on MSNBC, on every channel. When Muslims are attacked, he's the first one to defend us. Jazakallah khairan. We owe him. We, we should be proud that he is from our, from our community. We have Judge David Shaheed. As an attorney, these past four years, whenever I say I'm a Muslim, they say, do you know Judge Shaheed? Judge Shaheed is a respected judge. They love him as a judge. Chris Warden's here. He'll t he's been practicing for 10 years. And people love Judge Shaheed. He has led the way in, the, in our bar. And we should thank him every single day that he is part of our community. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. You met the Secretary of State today. You met R Sheriff Roy Dominguez, who drove down from Gary, Indiana. He's planning to run for governor. And, and for many of you who may not have guessed it, so is Todd Rokita. He's here because he wants your votes. We had a Republican and Democrat, two possible uh, candidates. They want your votes. They want your money. They're here to see you. There's a reason. They think this is a good place to be. This is a good place for them to garner votes and money. But we have two special guests today here. Um, and I'm going to ask them briefly to stand. Uh, Vop Usili. <laughs> Tom McKenna. Both of them, please be seated, gentlemen. Both of them are distinguished Hoosiers. And they're here in part because they love us. But let's be honest, they also want your votes. And they also want your money. Because they're running for Secretary of State, they're both Democrats. They're going to have to fight it out amongst themselves, but then they want you to be there with them. And they're here because they recognize how important you are. But at the same time, I think it's important that we remember Tom McKenna, Vapo Sealy, Roy Dominguez, Todd Rokita. They were here this week to meet you in person, to shake your hands. We're not a we're a nonprofit organization. We don't endorse anybody. But as a Muslim, we remember who we shook our hands with, who broke, our, broke bread with. And we don't forget that. And we appreciate you coming here today. <laughs> I've, taken more, I've taken more of your time than I should. But I just briefly want to do two quick things. Because um, I'm here as the face or the leader of the Muslim Alliance of Indiana. But honestly, uh, I'm just the one that's taking all the credit, and then through email, sometimes taking all the discredit. But I want you to I want to introduce to you my staff, without whom none of this would be possible. Could the staff of the Muslim Alliance of Indiana, Rafia, Shejia, Catherine, <laughs> Fasia, <laughs> Mr. Warden, Mr. Warden, <laughs> who am I missing? You need to see these people. These are the most amazing people you'll ever meet. They are Muslim Hoosiers. They are why we will continue to be successful. They are amazing people, and I want you to, whenever you see them, make sure you thank them, because they deserve all of our thanks. I am going to call Brother Razi Malam for the next part of our program. Let me just clarify. OK, so I'm. Just to let you know, what are we planning for next year? Because we have these great events. We clap, we t do the takbirs, we have great food, we hang out, we network. What are we going to do next year for you? The first thing I want to announce is everything we're doing, we're going to do better. Everything we're doing, we're going to do better. Next year, we're not going to serve 500 indigent poor. We're going to serve 1,000 indigent poor. This year, we've already started working with the legal defense of Burmese. They need to get their adjustment of status done so they can be permanent legal residents. They can have the same rights as all of you. We've already started doing that. Next year, we will serve 250 families through your help. Next year, in addition, we're announcing two new initiatives. 
the Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb College and a think tank that is yet to be named. Muhammad Alexander Russell Webb was the first Muslim ever to be appointed ambassador to Philippines or ambassador in the United States. He was appointed by Hoosier President Benjamin Harrison. How many people know that Benjamin Harrison appointed a Muslim to be a diplomat? How many of us know that Alexander Russell Webb was appointed the first Muslim? Not many. And we thought, first, we're going to honor that and honor that Hoosier connection by announcing this college. This college will do two amazing things. We have wonderful faculty. Many of them are here. We're going to be asking them to teach one course a year for free. We're then going to go out to poor people, people that have not had the same opportunities as all of us. And we're going to say, we're going to provide you a free education. For every credit hour that you do with us for free, we'll go ask you for, to doing, for, for you to do 10 hours of community service. Not for us, but for the nonprofit of your choice. We are going to build a volunteer core that is going to be multi-faith and we're going to provide an education to those people that may not have dreamed. We're going to not go to a bricks and mortar. We're not going to build, spend millions of dollars on a building. We are going to go to the public libraries and offer these courses. We're going to go to churches and mosques and offer these courses. We are going to go to the Julian Center and the Salvation Army and offer these courses. We believe but if we can teach, if we can go to them, in a safe setting, teach them English 101, they're going to learn from us this one time, then they're going to go to Ivy Tech, and they're going to go to other schools, and we're going to have an educated community. And it's going to happen because Muslims are going to support that. The second initiative, it's an unnamed think tank. We want scholars, students, leaders, all of us to think, who are we? What do we do? And how do we make this world, this country, and this state a better place? And it's going to be a multidisciplinary effort. La La We've asked John Clark, who is a leader in developing think tanks. He was part of the Hudson Institute. Then he, f he helped create the Sagamore Institute of Policy and Research. He's created think tanks all over Eastern Europe and Central Europe. And now, because we asked him, and because we have the reputation that we do, he's going to be joining us and helping us uh, s establish a Musl Muslim Hoosier think tank. These are just some things that we do. In addition to that, we will continue to go to schools that deny your children a day off when you, when, when you have Eid. We'll continue to go to schools that put materials before their teachers that is against Islam. We're going to continue to go to employers who, who fire you or give you bad jobs because you're Muslim. And we're going to continue to go talk to the police chiefs that arrest you because you are Muslim. The Council of Islamic Relations, Muslim Public Affairs Council, we've met with them. They've asked us to be their affiliates in this state. We are not an affiliate. We do not, we, we, we do not have any parent national organizations, but we work with all national organizations, and CARE does great work, MPAC does great work, a lot of other Muslim organizations do great work. We're going to work with them. We're going to use the models that work for us. We're going to change the ones that fill our need best and we're going to work with everybody that's out there. So I'm going to, next year is going to be all about the kinds of people that we can bring together. And we need more than just this. We need you to come to our events. Because when Vop comes to an event and he says, Sharik, can I have an event? He's not going to be impressed if it's just me standing there. He needs to see a diverse group of people there. And I need you to be there every time Vop asks. When Tom says, I need to meet with you guys, I need you to be there because he's not going to be impressed on if I'm there alone. And all the other people that I'm going to be calling on you again and again and again, if I send you an email, please open it and read it, because I'm going to be calling upon you to really work and fight for yourself and for your family and for your community. As Brother Razi has already mentioned, Islamic Relief has offered us a challenge grant this night. Islamic Relief loves us. We love Islamic Relief. Uh, they, uh, in addition to funding us this past year, for next year have said that if tonight we are able to raise $25,000, they will match it. Now, if we raise $24,999, we don't get $24,999. We have to raise $25,000 to get $25,000. Should we get that, 
we will be end this year with enough money so that we will have we will have enough money for all of next year. And remember, it's going to be one third individual charity, one third user fees, and one third is going to be grants. So I'm going to ask my brother Razi to come up, and uh, we'll walk walk you guys through the next ten minutes, inshallah. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Sharik. Um, Brother Sharik has, has told you about the many things that MEI has uh, been trying to do and has, has, has done. It's going on, and that will continue to, uh, inshallah, uh, grow and help us establish ourselves as, uh, uh, a, strong, as a strong community uh, and a vibrant community of Muslims in Indiana, inshallah. Uh, we, we uh, as, as Brother Sharik mentioned, we have been challenged by Islamic Relief to um, sh uh, prove that we are supporting that effort strongly, and if we show them that, they will match uh, what we contribute uh, with $25,000. That would be a tremendous boost uh, to the work that MAI is trying to do. And so we're asking you to uh, support uh, the work uh, of MAI, uh, the uh, needs of the Muslim community in Indiana, uh, all of the Muslim community in Indiana, throughout the state, uh, and from uh, diverse uh, backgrounds in, in terms of ethnicity uh, and where we've come from and diverse needs that exist in terms of uh, legal services, uh, in terms of abuse situations where people need help, and uh, in terms of getting uh, uh, Islam and Muslims known. His removal was a huge blow to a nation that was founded by the great Muhammad Ali Jinnah. We work with the Obama administration, we work with Congressman Keith Ellison and others to get him reinstated. But it took the people of Pakistan to lead the effort. And especially it took the young people to lead the effort in what is now known as the Long March. And shortly after the young people demonstrated, Chief Justice Chaudhry was reinstated to the Supreme Court. Because of these brave Pakistanis, they inspired others. This summer we watched with horror and dismay as Iranians were brutally beaten and killed while peacefully demonstrating against their government. They were standing up for one simple thing, to ensure that their vote was counted. Even in the face of government intimidation and violence, these protests continued for weeks in Iran. I see a number of my Muslim sisters in the audience today who are very well educated and successful professionals. But unfortunately, millions of your fellow sisters in Islam are denied an education. They're denied, especially in places like Afghanistan, or Afghanistan, as my South Asian brothers and sisters say. They're denied simply for trying to attend grade school. This is unacceptable. Locally, we saw, as, as my dear friend Sharik mentioned, an incident that occurred earlier this year, unfortunately, with the head of Bridges TV and his spouse. And uh, I bring that up because if we're going to make a mark in this country, and by Allah's grace, we're seeing more Muslims engaged in the political process. We have Muslim state representatives. We have Muslim city councilors. We're fortunate to have two Muslim members of Congress, myself and, myself and my dear friend Keith Ellison, but it's not enough. If we're going to be engaged in the political process, we have to do it, but we have to be organized. Some of you know um, uh, one of our financial advisors on our campaign, Sister Emily Gerwitz, who, ha Gerwitz, who happens to be Jewish, she told me something very profound, and Shark, you know Emily's spirit. She said, you know, and Emily used to work for our friends at APAC, <laughs> but Emily told me something interesting, Al Huda. 
She said, you know, I see why certain groups are afraid of the Muslims. I said, what do you mean, Emily? She said, because Muslims have just as much money, they're just as educated as anybody else, but they're so disorganized. And that's what makes them irrelevant. Now, I tried to play it off and defend her, but in my heart, I said, man, she's right. People see the wealth of knowledge that we have and what we bring to the table, but we need to come together and be more organized. When President Obama took office, right before he took office, we were faced with some challenges. On the one end, those of you who helped my efforts, and helped Brother Ellison's efforts, uh, were very well aware of the atmosphere of bigotry that was so pervasive in 2008. There were commercials put out, campaigns questioning uh, Brother Ellison's credibility and ties. And there were YouTubes put out against me and President Obama and trying to tie us up to Al-Qaeda and some other groups. But the people spoke up. Muslims went to the polls in droves, and Muslims made a statement. But that wasn't enough. Before President Obama took office, there was still a deep level of suspicion around him. In the beginning of 2009, we were faced with issues. And we had to make a decision. A resolution came up in the House of Representatives. And the resolution addressed the U.S.'s commitment to Israel. The resolution was not proportional. No piece of legislation is really proportional. And I cast a vote, and Ellison cast a vote that was a present vote. I cast a yes vote, and Muslims were upset with both of us. Understandably so, but then I saw another group rise up who actually read the resolution. I'd probably say 98% of the people never read the resolution, but that's another story. It goes back to being disorganized. There were emails about it. I got more phone calls about the resolution than I did when I voted for S-CHIP. S-CHIP was a piece of legislation that ensures that children of migrant families are insured. We're talking about 9 million children being covered. Didn't get one call. Voted in favor of a Wall Street bailout. That affects many companies that are led by Muslims. Not one call. But on a resolution, we got a lot of calls. While we were excited about the activity, and Keith and I, and Keith and I, we take a different approach. You know, we're both trying to get downtown. I, I take Meridian, he takes Pennsylvania or Capitol Avenue, but we're still getting downtown. And Keith and I talked about this thing. And he and I raised the same thing. Where was the passion before the vote? I voted for it for three primary reasons, though it was, wasn't proportional. It called for a two-state solution. That's what we all want, but realistic. It called for an apology to those brothers and sisters in Gaza. And it called for sending money to that region. After the vote, we met with Secretary Clinton, and I mentioned it to President Obama, and we sent a letter with other members of Congress. And weeks after that, we were able to get millions of dollars to the brothers and sisters in the Gaza region. As a result, <laughs> I think that we are embarking on a new day where it's time for us to show new leadership and bold leadership, not the kind of leadership that has led us in the past, based solely on emotionalism. Weeks after that resolution, thank you for your applause, <laughs> weeks after that resolution, a Muslim sister was decapitated, beheaded. They said, don't say beheaded, say be she was beheaded 
in New York, outside of MAI, and I applaud you for speaking out, and a few other brothers and sisters, you didn't hear a sound from Muslims. Where was the outrage? Why weren't the brothers who are outspoken on so many other issues, why weren't their undergarments up in a bunch over a Muslim sister being decapitated? That's a critical question that we have to raise. And it's the kind of hypocrisy that will continue to hurt our efforts. The world is watching the Muslim community. And if you're unwilling to speak up about a Muslim sister being decapitated, nobody cares about what you think about a lifeless resolution. We won't see the kind of mobility that we need unless we get together. I was in Chicago, and I love Chi-Town, and we got to get back there soon. And I said, well, how many Muslims are in Chicago? And someone told me almost a million Muslims, 800,000 to 750,000. You mean to tell me there are that many Muslims in Chicago and there isn't one congressional representative? You mean to tell me that there are over a million Muslims in the New York area and there's only one city councilor? And I met him. What's the problem? New Jersey has a Muslim mayor. They have a Muslim city councilor. But we need more. We need many more. I was going up I-65 a few weeks ago. And on my way to Chicago, and I went through Jasper County. I went through White County. I went through Carroll County. And I saw a bunch of wind farms, miles and miles of wind farms. We have a great opportunity. Just last year, over 100,000 Hoosiers lost their jobs. 100,000. The American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, also known as the stimulus, will provide and produce more jobs. It's already putting Hoosiers back to work, but it isn't enough. I looked at this. And as I go to conferences and speak to Muslims, I'm proud of what we represent. We are some of the most educated, some of the most professional, some of the wealthiest people you ever want to meet. But the greater reality is that over 80% of the American population is without college degrees. So there's a disconnect there. I'm saying that these wind turbines that I saw going north on 65, it's an impressive reality. And I commend those farmers who negotiated that leasing agreement. But those wind turbines were built in China. Where are our Muslim engineers? Where are our small business owners? We have them, but who are involved in the green movement, who can put Hoosiers back to work. We know that half of the American population is employed by small businesses. Small businesses are the backbone of this country. Where are our Muslim small business owners? Where are our Muslim asset managers who can deal with the financial bailout? Are we ready? Are we ready to compete for federal contracts and act as primaries, not just be happy as subs, that's good, but act as primaries, Brother Chris Warden. I don't know if they're ready. Where we can show over $100 million in capital and show the capacity where we can act as such. I meet with so many ambassadors from Africa and, and the Middle East, and I say to myself, you know, why aren't there any Muslim consulting companies helping them out? Have we really made the connection? If you look at the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, you see a lot of Muslim contributors. And some of these brothers and sisters have, great, have a great wealth of knowledge as it relates to international affairs. Why aren't we taking advantage, Brother Sharik, of some of these consulting contracts? We don't have any. I'm limited what I can do ethically. But see, we talk a good game. We, once we give to these candidates, myself included, and we have Brother Vop and Brother Tom here, we're so happy to see them. Not them, they're good people. But once we give to these candidates, we have to make them accountable. 
my staff says I shouldn't use this language, especially with these cameras rolling, but I think the context is appropriate. When you're courting someone, you want to show them that you're interested. You want to take them out for dinner. You want to be clean. You want to walk them alongside the beach. You don't want to show disrespect or be vulgar by calling them at 2.30 a.m. in the morning, expecting them to show some attention. Or at 2.30 a.m. in the morning when no one's watching. The younger generation, they call that a booty call, not to be vulgar, Congressman. Mm -hmm. But we're all grown. Don't act like you don't know. But that's the kind of disrespect that we've seen from elected officials. They come, they get our money, they say, ah, Skamire Bacon, whatever you say. And then we're happy that they showed up. We're happy that they showed up. But if we're going to give to them and support their efforts, not these two, they're visionary. But if we're going to support their efforts, we have to hold elected officials accountable and make them accountable. And when they cast votes that we don't like, we need to call them. All of them, not just the two Muslims, all of them. <laughs> don't try to be safe and call me and Keith. <laughs> call all of them. <laughs> We've seen many movements in this country. We've seen the abolitionist movement to end slavery. We've seen the civil rights movement, the feminist movement. We see movements, but where is the Islamic renaissance? I think it's beginning right here with MAI. We need a renaissance in this country. I want to say to you, as I close, that this is a place for great possibilities and opportunities. I'm looking in the audience at the next US ambassadors to Senegal, to Russia, to the Middle East, to China, to Australia, to Micronesia. Why not? Why can't a Muslim be a, the ambassador to Australia? I'm looking at the next city councilors who will change this city. I'm looking at the next mayors and governors and members of Congress, not in the 7th Congressional District yet, but members of Congress. <laughs> But it's going to take us being engaged in the political process. Let us be a resource to you. Isna had a meeting. Is Sister Ingrid Madsen still in town? And she didn't make it out. She's a wonderful sister. She was the, the first president of Isna. The first a renaissance in this country. Isna's taking charge. We need more Muslim women at the forefront. We have, great mo we have great models for success in Khadija radiallahu anha, Aisha radiallahu anha, but we need more. I, I, you know, I want to think big and say in at least 10 or 15 years, we could have a Muslim woman as president with or without hijab. You want to walk with me? I don't know if some brothers are ready for that, sisters. Are you ready for that? What will it take? Brothers, too. You know, we're sensitive. Brothers, too. But, as long, but if we put Muslim women out into the forefront, that solves 80% of our public relations problem. Most of the American people, when they think about Islam, they don't think about us worshiping some false god. They think about Muslims being womanizers, Muslims being po abusive polygamists, Muslims keeping their women at home, we should put, push more Muslims to the forefront to be leaders. And whatever we do, we should strive to do it with excellence. Look at this program. This is something that we can be proud of, proud of. I can bring my friends to a place like this. We can bring elected officials and leaders here. We can bring President Obama here. Look at the sharpness and professionalism that we see in this audience. Something to be proud about. I've been to some Eids, and people say, hey, I want to learn about your religion. I said, well, right now, no, nah, not right now. <laughs> that folk coming in looking crazy? <laughs> to each his own. But I'm studying more. And Sister Khadija, you did a good program up in DC. And I, I applaud you for that. And keep up the great work. But I want to touch on something. Yeah. 
when we have these advocacy groups that come to Capitol Hill or the State House, let, let's, 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 let's think that this is the sale. You have elected officials 